my friends, and welcome to Friday. Happy, <laughs> happy Friday. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Oh my God. Got my girl B here. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you about this woman. I, I am so excited she said yes to be my oh. guest on the show. So while we're introducing this lovely lady and her tequila and lime um, <laughs> and my cucumber vodka, I want you to put in, and I know folks are still going to be joining, so we're going to have folks put in where they're calling from. Um, you know, it's funny because last week my guest was Natalie Kogan, and we met at the same event. No which, way. Yeah, which this is, is so a great awesome. commercial for the Massachusetts Conference of Women. No <laughs> kidding, right? So we are just getting started, and folks I'm sure are joining, but tell us a little bit about who you are and this magic that you have done for the world. Oh my goodness, Anne. Who doesn't want a friend like Anne Grady? Thank you so much for having me. I'm yeah. such a fan first. Well, I was a fan of hers before I was a friend of hers. So it's so good to see you. It's such an honor to be on your show. But my name is B. Arthur. That's my real name. And uh, I've been a licensed mental health counselor for over 10 years now. I went to Columbia here in New York City, here in Harlem, uh, and for counseling and clinical psychology back in 2008. And for the last 10 years, I've been in the psychology technology space. I was one of the first companies to move therapy online with video. My last company, Pretty Padded Room, was on Shark Tank and PR and TV. All of that stuff. I and then, that. Yeah. So that was crazy because it's literally been 10 years. And so, you know, for me, I still have so much more I want to do, but it's crazy that that all started like literally a decade ago. So, yeah, that's my passion. And my mission in life is just to make mass market mental health care easily affordable and accessible for everybody. Which I love because, you know, I, I've shared with, you know, my community before that, you know, my son Evan is severely mentally ill. And this week we had like a major blow up. He punched a window and broke the glass and tried to use the glass to cut himself. And, I, you know, it it just made me so frustrated that there's no help. You know, like yeah. he's at a facility where they're trained to help him. But there's parents right now trapped with their yeah. mentally ill kids at home. And I got to tell you, if he were at home right now, I don't know how I would like physically survive emotionally, right. psychologically. So I love that you're trying to make it accessible. What what got you in? What made you connect therapy and technology? It, it's funny. They say the best founders really are trying to solve a personal problem. <laughs> and for me, that was exactly it. The difference is my company now. We believe the right talk at the right time can make all the difference. And um, and the very first version of it, uh, which was pretty padded room, my first real startup attempt, came because my very first company which was fast and furious after grad school, died really quickly. And I was super depressed and super embarrassed, even though nobody knew because like I just finished grad school. And at the time, all my friends were therapists, all my mentors were therapists, literally I was a therapist in training and it was still hard for me to get started finding a therapist to deal with this like failure in my life. So I was like, damn, if this, if this is harder for me as an advocate, as a practitioner, how much harder is it for the average person? And now I love therapy, like I'm a big advocate for it. And so that's just always been my mission. I just know how valuable it is. And I want everybody to be able to have that value in their lives. So is this something where you could be like, hey, Alexa, I need some help? Like how how does the Sonos sponsored and the, I mean, you have Alexa teaching therapy, you got Sonos, you're involved with the crisis text line. Tell us about all of these things, because I'm so fascinated by it. Oh my God. Yeah. So we're going to, for the sake of this conversation, we're going to say Alyssa, because I am working from home. Oh. <laughs> And me and her are very close. So for the sake of our safe word, we're just going to refer to her. You have a safe word? With yes, because otherwise that's a wake word. We have a wake word and a safe oh. word. We're going to refer her as Alyssa. So I really love the idea of we built out the original skill for therapy. Um, and just with the goal of what, again, my whole mission is try to make easier cheaper, better access to therapists, whether or not you have a um, health insurance or not. Um, I've been banging this drum for 10 years about online therapy and Miss Rona came and showed <laughs> and revealed this whole time that I've been right because um, everybody's home and sad. So like there's never been a better time for online therapy right. or distance counseling. And so when I first came up with the concept in 2018, I really just was going for a mass play. Um, like I said, I've been in this space a long time. Um, there's a lot of different players that have entered the space. Shout out to Talkspace, shout out to BetterHelp, shout out to Seven Cups. Um, me and my Alexa, you talk about 
<laughs> oh no. So our two guests so far that have commented, and if you're here, comment. So I know we have more than just two guests, but Anne Bruce is my friend, mentor, coach, amazing human in California. And Dina is my right hand. She it does everything for me. And Amy is on as well. She's on my team as well. I Talk about being grateful for incredible people in your life. Mm. Beyond blessed, but keep going, keep going. Team is everything. Team support, your network is everything. And, and that's really what I want it to feel like. I want it to feel like everybody has an entourage like Anne and Dina and Amy. You know, I've been through several, uh, 10 years as an entrepreneur, I've been several, several, several dark nights of the soul. And literally the best, the thing that got me through it were my family, my friends, my entrepreneur friends, who I could be completely honest with about the struggle, who kept me going, who reminded me that like my life is more than my business, that I matter more than this my piece should come first all that kind of stuff and i'm really lucky because i have to say i'm a very intense personality and without that i could have slipped into darker episodes so i want everybody to have the benefit of that kind of network and support and um you know i think a few years ago life coaches kind of came in and kind of cannibalized our industry and, yeah. and understandably so it's better branding you know people think therapy they think about problems people think life coach they think about solutions and future but there's a lot of gifts in this business that we learn in this field it's it's really an honor to do this work so i'm trying to make therapists the new kardashians you know like i like to say i'm the chris jenner of therapy i'm just trying to make us everywhere because this is a real good thing and people need people right now more than anything so i like to say therapists are professional people professional people yeah. person so that's what we're doing well and you know i i've been in some sort of therapy you know even before evan but then i you know since evan's been an 11, 11 month old we've been in therapy and then i you know we've had mm -hmm family therapists and individual therapists and, and the whole nine yards. And I think there's still like, I feel like my mission, my purpose is to reduce the stigma of mental illness because there is still so much shame around it. And I, I think people are afraid to talk about it. I was looking at a study from, it's like the ongoing COVID impact study from University of Chicago. And it said two thirds of Americans say that they have felt anxious, depressed, or lonely at least once in the last seven days. And I'm like, only once? Yeah, like, and since the seven days, try the last 10, no. Try the last 10 minutes, right? Like, <laughs> Honestly, you're, exactly, yeah. You're in the heart of it, you're in New York City. Tell me what is going on there. How are people coping? You know, I wouldn't know because I'm being a good citizen and I'm staying inside. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I have it's hard because I love the city. I've been here 15 years, you know, so like um, I feel like I was going to be a lifer. But now, yeah, a lot of people are leaving. Um, it's hard, though, because there's a certain love for this city. And, and it's just, you know, if because of the density, if you go on the subway, you're going to get it. You know, it's just unavoidable. So luckily, Cuomo seems to have a good command of the situation. Um, th we're on the downside of the curve, but a lot of people are getting laid off. And I think with the, the panic and the uncertainty about the fall wave or whatever we're predicting, um, in addition to what this will look like economically in a place that loves work, this city loves to hustle. I remember, I'll never forget it. We remember when the dominoes started to fall in March and we all remember, we're like, how seriously should we take this? And I was actually supposed to shoot a pilot. Shout out to Roy Wood Jr. <laughs> Tribulations coming soon. I promise. They were Comedy Central's trying to make therapy pop in too. But anyways, we we're supposed to shoot it at the very last minute. The venue got canceled. They were just like, we can't have more than thirty people. And um, and I'm walking to the subway, and I'm like walking by this restaurant in Penn Station, and I see this like guy just like mopping the shit out of this floor. <laughs> And I was just thinking, like, as much as we complain about work, like, that is the heart of the city. We do love to work. We're proud of what we do. And having all that stopped because of this is, is unfortunate. So it's it's really looking ahead to how we come back after this. And you can speak to that, certainly. Yeah. And I know I was disappointed because I was supposed to join you in New York. We were going to do, I was going to be a guest on your show. And then we speak so to the crisis text line. Tell us a little bit more about the crisis text line and what your role is there and what they do and how people get a hold of them if they need it. Because oh my God, yes, talk about resource. Amazing. Let's talk about it. So anybody who's struggling at home, this is my personal plea and invitation to you. Crisis Tech Line was founded by my friend, mentor, and just all around life force, Nancy Lublin. Uh, she was the originally founded Dress for Success. She was the CEO of Do Something for several years. And the last six years, I believe she founded Crisis Tech Line, which is a nonprofit here in New York City that's been backed by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And basically what they did is modernize the suicide hotline. So you can text, anybody can text 741-741 at any time 
and you'll be connected with a very well-trained crisis counselor. Um, and it's only within 48 hours, but they can make resources to other nonprofits. Um, Nancy and I are also on the steering committee for Kenneth Cole's New Mental Health Coalition. I actually should connect you with them because they love you. Also um, with the goal of um, stopping the stigma and really bring together all the resources around mental health that are available now. And so in addition to Nancy just being like my friend and hero, um, we also are the therapists for their therapists, you know, um, because yeah. they do manage like volunteer crisis counselors. They have real therapists and supervisors who manage those teams. And those therapists started to experiencing vicarious trauma just from all the stuff that they hear. So we're the therapists for their therapists. And that's kind of what we've seen in general, a lot of corporations are reaching out to us to provide corporate counseling. They were already because of the show Billions, because it became really hot after. Yep. Yep. I love <laughs> it. Yeah, I always say I'm chocolate Wendy. So <laughs> in so many ways, like you don't even so understand. You don't even understand. I kind of even have a Paul Giamatti situation. You don't even understand. So, <laughs> it, so <laughs> I'll tell you about it after camera. You wear a rubber band on, on your leg and have to like snap it. It's confidentiality goes both ways and and Brady, but um, I have been doing it. We're gonna have to edit this. I have been doing it before Miss Rona came through, but after Miss Rona came through, and especially with the layoffs that kept coming and just the anxiety, um, I think companies are realizing that yes, not only are their employees working from home, but they're worried about losing their jobs. They're worried about so many things, and so I think when we come back to this, it'll be seen as irresponsible if you don't provide some kind of transition service. Um, for what we're doing. And actually I brought on Amy Ogden. I hope she's watching this uh, as our head of enterprise sales to manage all of the inbound and stuff. So yeah, there's a lot going on. That's awesome. I'm, I love that you're trying to make it accessible because you know, I can tell you our insurance system, you know better beyond, than it's been horrible for us. Like we have a $10,000 deductible Oof. and it's like $2,500 a month and they still don't cover anything for Evan in Idaho. And it's just been, yeah, it's been like, I mean, we were going through the cost of medical stuff in the last 10 years and I could live in Oprah's house. I mean, it has yeah. just been like insane. And I'm so grateful and blessed that I get to have a, a career that allows yeah. that, but it's mm -hmm. been intense and it's so hard. In fact, you know, the next door app we have um, in our neighborhood, there's a, there was someone who said there was a guy on my porch last night and someone else chimed in and they said, yeah, he's mentally ill. He lives mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. His parents, like he's not dangerous. He just sometimes sneaks out and needs a place to sit. So he'll go sit on people's porches. And it's like, before I had Evan, I would have been like, well, I don't want a crazy person on my porch. Mm -hmm. but now I'm like, my kid could be the crazy person on the porch. Mm -hmm. And why are we not looking for help? You know, like all these people who have judgment about it going, all right, well, you find a good place for him to live that's affordable and safe with well-trained staff to take care of him. And then you can quit bitching about the man sitting on your porch. It's just awful. It's, I mean, it's honestly a crime against humanity <laughs> because I mean, first of all, there's a big difference between mental health and mental illness. And I think just the way we talk about it has kind of conflated it. So people just think it's all bad. Nobody wants to be the yeah. crazy in the porch, right? Tell but, us like, how you differentiate that. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially mental illness refers to the one out of five. Whenever you hear that number one out of five people are affected by mental illness. So this actually refers to people with true diagnosable mood or personality disorders. And we're mostly in this case referring to what we call access to disorders in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So this is like narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. And a true mood disorder is like bipolar you know, disorder. Because there's remember, there's a big difference between clinical depression and just circumstantial depression. Exactly. Right? Because right now everybody's depressed because of Miss Rona. But like if you if like things were great and you had everything and you still just your your mental ke chemical imbalance was off, you would still right. feel the symptoms of depression. So yeah. that's mainly the difference. One is organic and one is circumstantial. And so with mental illness, like what your son has, yeah, there should be way more number one research because in some cases there can't be treatment. So we can just understand how do we improve some of the symptoms because we understand the poor causes. Same thing with autism research. There's not enough about looking about what it's like for the individual experiencing. Rather, it's all about managing the symptoms. You know, and we've yeah. seen in so many cases like people with bipolar disorder or actually created penises but they pathologized it there's plenty of talented people with autism who are pathologized because of their spectrum disorder so it's a mess yeah and he's got both um he's got like the, the perfect neurological storm bipolar nos and 
autism and sensory integration and oppositional yeah. design disorder. So that it's just kind of a jumble. But I love that you distinguished mental health from mental illness. So how do you define mental health? So mental health is what everyone has. I mean, I think it's better to refer to it as your mental state. Um, because if you think about it, again, it always comes in, oh, nothing's wrong with my mind, stay out of it, right? But um, mm -hmm. if you look at the word psychology, it actually comes from the Greek word psyche, the study of the psyche. And it doesn't actually mean mind, it means soul. So oh. yeah, what I've always loved. So if we think about it, whether in the difference between a mental illness versus a soul condition, we can understand how it all goes together, why we don't need to be ashamed of it. Because even if we're just talking about mental health, I'm anxious because I don't know what's gonna happen to my job or my family, right? right? That's a very normal response. It would be weird if I didn't feel bad, right? right. I'd be like right. anti-social, I wouldn't care about my family or my job. So like there's um, information in emotions, but we're so scared of our emotions that we just avoid them altogether. So that's what therapy does, help us understand ourselves better and help us to function better. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I I sometimes forget that it's easy to think, and I, maybe you experience this, it's easy to think because you're an ex expert at something or you have a title that you don't struggle with it too. Oh. And I think, you know, at least the saying I always have, you know, if those who can't do teach, those who can't teach consult, those who can't consult speak. So <laughs> oh, I feel seen. But Absolutely. it's like, you know, when it happened this week with Evan, I sat on this couch back here mm -hmm. and I was crying and I like I was so tempted to go curl up on the couch and watch a Law and Order SVU episode because I love you. Love it. It. Benson. But I, it. I was working on the part of my book. It comes out October 6th and I was we're in the last edit. And so I'm. I, I was working on the part about uncomfortable emotions mm -hmm. and the idea that we try to numb them and run away from them makes them so much more intense and make them last so yes. much longer. Exactly. And so then I'm just sitting there and I'm really trying to practice this mind over moment thing that I'm writing about, which is like, mm -hmm. what did I feel? I felt angry. I was sad. I was disappointed. I was scared for him and for us. Um, where did I feel it? In my chest, it was heavy. I had trouble breathing. I felt like I couldn't catch an entire breath. And my husband came upstairs and he was like, let's talk through it. Let me make it, I'll fix it. And I'm like, no, I just need to sit in the shit for a second, right? Yeah. Like I just need to sit in it and honor it. Mm -hmm. honor it. Yeah, and I think that is so hard for people to do because we're taught from a very young age, turn that frown upside down and don't worry, you have so much to be grateful for. And That's so a very American thing. That's a very yeah. American thing. We have a very active culture of avoidance, right? <laughs> um, and I think, uh, yes. especially when the mindfulness movement came through, it was all about positive energy. Oh, I can't even hear about anything. that I can't engage with anything negative. And that set us back in our emotional development so many years and decades. It's actually what's happened to men already. Like, I love men, you know, but because we don't allow them to experience the full range of emotions, they become limited in their emotional and personal intelligence. Um, and just like you said, what you resist returns to you. Like the longer you avoid dealing with something, the more it's going to stay with you. This is what therapy does. It lets you get it out of your body, get it out of your mind so you can get on with your life. You beat that level of Super Mario Brothers, you know? And yeah. that's how it works. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Next level achieved. Because it doesn't ever get easier. You just get better. You don't get as bothered by it. Yeah. Is that something you can build that kind of e emotional, you know, I talk about resilience as a muscle. Yeah. How do you build the emotional strength and emotional resilience How, other than sitting in the discomfort? What are some things you do to help people work through those feelings that can be so overwhelming, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, acute and, and something that we're experiencing right now, like you said, that's situational, mm -hmm. or whether it's like mine, which is a more chronic, long-term clinical type of illness, what is your advice? How do you help people build that emotional muscle? Yeah, and I love that when, when you and I first met, because I always talk about mental strength as opposed to mental health or mental illness. And so I also call it mental stamina, 
right? And because it's about getting your mind to and through something. And the reason I say to as well, because even sometimes with good things, we don't have, we're still scared to go forward with it, you know? And so that's just how we are as creatures. Once there's a new unknown terrain, we just want to stop and stay safe. So there is, as far as like how to get through it, you have to trust yourself to know that you'll be, you can get to the other side. And that's the beauty of therapy. Every, it doesn't matter how bad it is for clients. I've been in the room with murderers, like people with, in the room, with people who come out of jail, addicts in recovery, all sorts of people. And I can always see what it'll be like for them when they have peace, you know, when they've accepted it, when they realize they can't do anything with it, you know, because you can't take that pain with you where you're going, you know, which is to have peace and understand yourself. So it all starts with self-discovery, right? If you know how your work and the patterns that got you there, you can help yourself once you get to a crisis moment. So for example, I just had, I'm building a business during a pandemic. I am so jealous of y'all that can be bored at home. I am so bored. I mean, I'm the opposite of, I wish I was bored. I wish I could fuck around on Instagram. Yeah. I am still fucking around on Instagram if you see me, but it's a coping mechanism, right? Because I'm trying to distract myself. Same thing. I'm getting a little thicker because I'm an emotional eater and I'm allowing it. It, you know, yeah, girl, gummy bears are a stress food and that's just science, you know? So I think that the main thing that people need to remember is to allow it. You know, one of the reasons that, forgive me for being vain, but that people like me so much is because I like talking about bad things. You know, I never, people come to me and they tell me anything like you're safe here. Like, doesn't it feel better to talk about this thing that's bothering you? Like give into it. There's nothing better than a good cry, a good self-indulgent, self-pity party. Give into it, you know, like just honor this. I think it was Bob Marley who once said, and I'm not sure, don't quote me, but I think it was Bob Marley who said that every emotion deserves equal respect. And that is just something I live by. There is something to learn from every single emotion. And um, and once you've mastered it, like it doesn't control you anymore. Is there a way to master it? Is there a way to yeah. master emotion? Yes. It, and you, it, you can't engage with it. At a certain point, you see it, right? You like, like what happened to you with your son? Like you see it. You wish it weren't true. You go through all the stages of grief, right? Because this is an injury. This is a wound. And then you realize you can't do anything about it. And it doesn't make sense to keep it still alive. It's in the past. You know, when you look at depression, it's an excessive focus on things that are happening or have happened in the past. And when you look at anxiety, it's excessive focus on things that may happen in the future. Hmm. So oh, that's, both. <laughs> so that's your life needs to be more than work and more than worry. Yeah. You know, and it's so interesting that you said that we posted something this week that said, like, your value isn't what you do. And I think for people who I, I don't I, I'm, I've always been like a really goal oriented, high performing, high achieving person. Mm -hmm. And so for me, self-compassion has been the hardest nut to crack because there's always something I feel like I, sh you know, people say, just do your best. Well, I don't feel like my best is ever, ever enough, enough ever right? Enough. Which is why I named my book strong enough because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like, you know, you just have to be strong enough. You don't have to be the strongest person in the world. Um, mm -hmm. How do you practice self-compassion when you've got self-loathing? Like there's oh, some my people God. who struggle. Oof, it has been such a struggle for me. I'm half Virgo. So I'm a perfectionist. Like I hold, I always say I hold myself to a really high standard, but I just recently realized that I was just limiting myself so I can never enjoy my accomplishments, you know, because you know what it's like in our line of work. By the time it makes the press, like it happened three months ago, right? right? And you have a new problem that you're working on. And that's been my life for the last 10 years. It's press on the outside and mess on the inside. <laughs> like literally, I smoke so much weed, you know. So it's just like, it, you know, it's so hard. And, and recently, because I went through, like, I'm building a business and things happen all the time, right? Like 80% of the time. And last week, something happened that just like really devastated me. And I was talking to my homegirl about it. And she was like, I was just like, I just feel so overwhelmed. And like, I can't do it. And she's like, you're not overwhelmed. You're just going through shit. You know, like, that is how it looks from any angle. Why am I trying to pretend it's something else? Hmm. You know, and I, again, I've sat in the room with everybody. Everybody has their reasons. Nobody means to end up where they get, where they end up. Right. But everybody deserves peace, including me. And, and I have to say that to myself all the time. Whatever I do, 
I know that I did it with the best intentions. I wasn't trying to be bad. I wasn't trying to scream. Myself. And I'm just really just allowing myself love. I take baths now. You know, I'm just really just trying to love myself through it. Because that's all that matters. I don't know what's going on out there. It's ugly out there on the news. I have no right. idea. All I can do is take care of this vessel. And that'll hopefully lead to something good. And, you know, it's funny because Sean Aker said something that I've started incorporating into my work. And I've been doing a ton of virtual resilience building workshops and keynotes. And he said, you know, the first 30 minutes you're awake and the last 30 minutes you're awake, you're cognitively the weakest, like you can't prioritize information or put it into context. And I found that the first thing that I was doing when I was waking up was turning on the news and checking my email and right. checking social media, how many likes, how many comments, how many mm -hmm. people they're following, you know, because it's just this external validation that I think yeah. can become an addiction. Yeah. And so it, it's, I, I've tried to really stop that. Do you watch the news? I mean, do you? It's the best. So I'm going to tell you what I would tell you if you were my client. And then I'm going to tell you the truth about how I live my life. Because right. okay. <laughs> let me, I know, let me drink for this one. Yeah. And y'all chat in questions if you have them and, and comments. Cause you know, cause it's Friday. It's, it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, dude, the news is bad. Like we weren't meant to have this many thoughts in our mind. We already do, right? They say that I think the numbers are 80% of our thoughts are repetitive. Like for the most part, your life is the same and it knows how to handle your life at that stage. Mm -hmm. And apparently 95% of those thoughts are negative. Yep. That's how we set up. See, whenever I tell people that, people don't even question it. They're like, I can see that totally. Because yep. your, your body is you know, designed to survive as an animal. And so part of the thing that keeps you alive is being on the offense and looking for what might kill you. So from an evolutionary psychology perspective, humans have evolved at such a fast rate that we haven't evolved with the context that perceived threats aren't actual death threats. So that's why I actually like have this, um, you know, I have a book too that like I'm very late on. Shout out to Kathy Schneider, my agent. She's so mad. I missed my deadline several times. But but we talk about all these different things and that anger really shows like what you're willing to 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 die for. Because that's your call to arms. That's when your adrenaline kicks in and you're really ready to fight for. So um yeah, I think that um wait, I forgot the question because I've had too much to do that. <laughs> Watching the news. Oh, we're good. Watching the news, wow. Don't let me go that far off, off topic. Um, <laughs> is resilience or confidence more important? That's a great question. Yes, yeah, so in the news, I have a, a really bad desire to see what's going on on Twitter. It's terrible. You see me on, on social, I'm not a big poster, but I'm a huge lurker because it's just like my free time and my peaceful time. Yeah. And yeah, I'm always seeing what's on the news, but like my best days when I need to sleep, when I need to have peace, and I want everybody to do this, sleep with your phone outside of the room, like plug it in over there. It's not even supposed to be plugged in all night anyway. So as much as you can and really try to just do something. If it's like getting out of bed first thing, walking around the block, they say a cold shower, a minute of a cold shower first thing in the morning is equivalent to 10 minutes of meditation. No shit. Something about the way it makes your brain go blank or something. I'd rather meditate for 10 minutes. I, I don't no, know. It's hard though. It is hard, but that's how you know it's working. So I used to have this like perception that meditation was supposed to be a calm Zen like experience. And what I learned through the research for the book and through the work that I'm doing is that your mind is designed to constantly wander. And every time you catch it and bring it back, what you're doing is you're growing back the gray matter in your brain that's damaged by stress. And so what ends up happening is you're not mm. trying to find peace. You're trying to train your brain to direct its attention where you want it to go instead of where it naturally goes on its own. So Ooh. the whole time is spent going, what am I going to have for dinner? And like, I forgot to call my mom. And why does the dog have a weird lump on his side? You know, like all of those things are natural. But every time you go back to your breath, you're training your brain to direct its attention where you want it to go mm. instead of the little monkey mind that we all have. I'm right. to sleep every night. I did a great meditation this afternoon by Tara Brock. She's fantastic. Um, Is she the one on calm? 
Uh, no, um, I have that app on my phone. I don't know what her name is, but she's great too. I, I downloaded Calm and it, it helps me. Okay. And so I do like to, at night, I slow my breathing and I try to meditate. And around the like 50th time your brain wanders, you're like, oh, screw it. I'm tired. And you just fall asleep because you're bored. But mm. it's been a game changer for me because it helps you recognize your thoughts and emotions without having to engage them. So you're able to go, I feel sad, I feel mm -hmm. anxious, I feel hurt. So that's emotional mastery then. When you said, is it possible? That's emotional mastery. You can see it, you can understand it, you can accept it, and then you can reject it. That's meditation. I have mastered my emotion. Are you kidding? No. You, all the time, you didn't even know it. You were it's just living in them. It's a practice. So Anne asked, is yeah. resilience or confidence more important? I wish I had more confidence. I think I've got a lot of resilience, but you should, that your resilience should give you the confidence. You've it proven should, it. It, it, it. Dad said that once. He's like, you can put me anywhere in the world, I'll come back. If like anywhere in the world, bury me under the sea, I'll find a way back. And it's said that? true. My dad, it's true. Like we are by any means necessary kind of people, even against our best interest. And I think me and you have like what what I'm what I will say about this life, it's very hard to be an entrepreneur. It's very hard to be in the healing professions. It's very hard to be in any client facing roles because it takes so much energy out of you. But what I will say the blessing of this business is having been on the opposite side of the therapist chair, so many people are searching for their purpose. So many people are searching from for their life force, what really wakes them up, you know, like keeps them up at night, wakes them up in the morning. It, I'm miserable most of the time, okay? But like, I just can't, the calling keeps calling. The calls keep coming. Anybody who's texting me, I owe you a call back, I'm just busy. But um, I just won't rest until this, this mission is done, you know? I'm grateful for and I think that's so important because people, you know, last week, Natalie Kogan was saying, you know, the job of your brain is not to make you happy. The job of your brain is to keep you safe. And so to your point, you know, your brain doesn't know the difference between what's on the news, a saber tooth tiger, you know, right. someone chasing you with a knife. It could be a snarky email from Carol in accounting, like your brain has the same reaction. <laughs> well, I don't think, you know, we sit there and judge how we feel. Like, why am yeah. I, why am I feeling this way? I have so much to be grateful for. I shouldn't feel bad. But if you go feel bad because we feel bad. Exactly. We have guilt over our emotions, which every time a friend comes to me, I'm like, that sounds normal to me. Like, let's just stay here a while. Like, isn't this a new feeling? Like, yeah, you're mad because of this thing that made you righteously anger. Oh my God, let's, what else? Like yeah. get into it for a second. Like what is pretending you're not upset going to do? So many times, man, when I used to be in the chair, I, I don't really do clients anymore. When I used to be in the chair, I'd be, you know, I'd get a person to like where they really understand what was going in the, on in their situation and where they stood in it. And, and, and it will be right. Cause therapy, good therapy anyway, doesn't tell you what to do. You know, we're supposed to walk you towards the answer. Cause deep down. Feel. <laughs> well, good therapists don't say that anymore either, but you're, you know, the high, the whole premise is that deep down you already know the truth which, you know, I believe, like in general, in crisis situations, you know where you need to move. But your conscious mind, your situations, your comfort are kind of keeping you there. And that's where the conflict is. And so there's so many times where I'll walk a client to write, so they see it clearly, this is probably what I should do next. And, but then they keep, they stay in that place. I'm gonna tell him this, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna stand up for myself, I'm quitting that job. And then it's like four or five more sessions. And I'm like, I'm so glad you feel comfortable telling me this out loud. Cause you couldn't even admit this to yourself six months ago. But don't you think like the problem would cease to exist if you actually talk to the person who could do something about it, you know, yeah. engage them in it, you know, and, and that is the part where, yeah, I think we need more confidence to your question about like just trusting that you'll be OK, like trusting that you can jump, make the leap and you're going to land, you're going to tumble, but you'll be OK. It's not going to literally kill you. And the more you can be comfortable with pain, the higher tolerance you have to risk pain, all that stuff, the more you'll be able to, to um, tolerate and be resilient through more, more situations. Do you ever sit in the therapist chair and like secretly wish you could either hang out with the person the and be friends with them or like you really want to tell them what they should do, but you, ha Ooh, you have all the time. I, I wish there was a way to do some kind of therapist confessional without violating confidence because like there i've learned so much from my clients and honestly like when i was still doing therapy and building the business it was the best because like i'd be so stressed about the company and then somebody would be telling me about this like equally hard mental challenge 
And you could see it for them that, oh, it's not as bad as they think, or, oh, as soon as these things go online, everything will clear out. And it's just a, such a great reminder. Um, and then that when there's couples counseling, I really liked couples counseling because I was a domestic violence counselor for several years. And you really, oh, wow. that was actually really great work because once they get out of the situation, things start to change very quickly. And so I was really grateful for that. But with couples counseling, there's similar power dynamics. It's just not outright abuse. So it's kind of a dance. It's very strategic. And so sometimes you see couples that, man, like in the first 10 minutes, you're like, how did these people even meet? Like, how did they even say hello to each other? Like they clearly are incompatible and cannot stand each other. But those are the ones that always try to make it work. It is nuts. Like they should not be together, but I can't say that. And then there's the clients who like, again, from a helicopter view, it's really not that bad, but because of like too, holding on to resentment for too long or things going on too much, they just can't make it work. And you can see if they can get past it and you can't say anything then either. So there's a lot of holding your tongue <laughs> in therapy, which is hard because a lot of bad therapists become therapists because they're bossy and they love telling people what to do. Mm -mm. Yeah, That is not what therapy is about at all. I love my therapist. I keep wanting to ask her to hang out, but I know she can't, but I'm like, Oh, come on, be on my Facebook live. And she's like, no, I can't, I can't. I, I have terrible boundaries. I have broken that several times where, cause you do, you, sometimes you have clients you don't like. Sometimes your clients have clients that you love. And I've had clients that like, I've had to fire myself from. I had one client and she like brought me this thing at the end, like for Christmas and you're not supposed to accept gifts, but like, who am I to like, turned down again and so and she was like you know i really wouldn't have made it through this year without you i love you and i was like i love you too and now this has to be our last session <laughs> because now we're too close right like now i'm just like your friends i'm always going to want to come on your side like just the impact you know the objectivity you need like the i can't be invested in you to give you good yeah. treatment and, and I just love, I love, especially I love survivors. I love people when they get to the other side. It's like, oh, and if it gets too close, I'm not going to be a good therapist for them and their continued growth. So you have to be really responsible. Do your, do your friends come to you all the time for therapy? This is why I'm a bad friend now, because like, yeah, like I just, especially when Ms. Rona came through, because literally in general, I'm just kind of a busy person and I'm really bad at replying to texts, but everyone was like freaking out like that first couple weeks. And I'm a lot of her people's go-to tell me it's gonna be okay person. And I was like, bitch, I don't know. Like I, like the first couple of weeks, I was just staring at a wall. Regularly, I caught myself just staring at walls. Like what's really going on, you know? So it's hard and people do that to me a lot. They'll just call and be like, hey girl, what's going on? And, and if I didn't ask for this, like I'm not in the right place. You have to warn someone if you're going to, right. to close things, even if you're a therapist, because I'm, I could say the wrong thing if I'm distracted, if I'm not in the mood, if I'm not in the right mindset. So yeah. I think, I hope everybody learns good boundaries through this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I imagine it would be tempting. It's like going to your friend who's a doctor and going, Hey, it hurts when I do this. Mm -hmm. What should I do? And, and it's like, okay, well, I wouldn't have become a doctor if I, my stepsister's a doctor and I called her and I was like, I'm throwing up. What do I do? And she was like, drink Go water. <laughs> It's hard. And I honestly think I've reached a cap on how many conversations I can have. Because honestly, look, look at this. I just have fallen behind. Look at all these texts and you can't see, but I just like don't. Oh I'm not my really God. Yeah, 100 and something? It, yeah, 100. Yeah. It just happened last summer after Techstars. Shout out to Techstars. But like they really took over my calendar. After tech, I just couldn't catch up, keep up with any of it. My friends, my own family. So it's just... I need to hire some people. We're hiring y'all. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you balance that? Because I, I, I feel that way too. Like if somebody texts me, I feel this almost guilt if I don't text back. And then I become overwhelmed. And then I'm like, well, now I've got 15 people to text back. And like, so what is your process for... I don't have one, girl. RIP my mentions. If, if my friends will tell you. I just hope people don't take it personally. Because when people do get one-on-one -on -one time, I mean, I am the most focused. Like, I really do love people and connecting with people. But, and this is, I think, what, and they said the numbers on anxiety and depression had gone up anyway before the virus came through. And I think it actually has a lot to do with, sorry, Facebook, Facebook. You know, because once social went mobile, and we were, had a reason to constantly be attacked. Hey, Facebook used to be a really good thing. We could just check in. But after it went mobile and after they introduced the news feed, which has no end, like the, it kept going. There is no reason to stop scrolling. My friend's boyfriend tried to like limit the, the habit himself and got all the you know, Twitter, everything off of his phone. And she caught him going through Venmo, just liking activities. <laughs> 
because his brain was just trained to just keep looking for information. It's just like the world's people. biggest slot machine. It's like you're craving this dopamine hit constantly needing something externally to make you feel good. And, and it's this stuff that makes you feel good, but it's mixed in with a whole bunch of stuff that makes you feel bad. So it's only useful up until the best thing you can do is limit your social use if you want to feel like a healthy human. But I mean, the thing, the good thing about this, if we get to the other side, is I think people will be sick of screens. Like I'm yeah. done with Zoom calls. I'm done with even Instagram. As much as I love Insta and TikTok, like I'm, I'm good. I would rather see people. I did a TikTok video with my daughter and she learned it in like two seconds and it took me like, Two hours. It's hard. Gen Z is like very quick on the uptick. I have one, but I'm just a lurker. I just they're so clever. I'm, I love Gen Z, but I just stay in my lane. I try to like stay active on all the different social channels, and I know you're supposed to pick one and spend most of your time there. But it's like it's exhaust. It's like a full time job just trying to. There's too much content. There's yeah. too much content. It's unfortunate. Have... Go ahead. No, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you, go, you go i'm all typical well i was just gonna say because there is so much content and so much noise yeah at some point it. people just start you know zoning out you need to take every, we all should take a full after this is done a full day of no phones like in the future when we go to the movies when we go to the club when we go to the amusement park i hope they you can put your phone in the locker somewhere because that is what we need to get more familiar with. We need to crave human connection again. And we need to be able to interact without this. You know, we're learning, we're forgetting how to be human. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really have to come back as how we want to be permanently. My mom, I hope my mom's not listening. She called me and I'm like watching the phone ring. And I'm like, can't you just text me? It's so much work. Just I to have literally been on people's Instagram stories and like liking something or leaving a comment. And the same person will call me to catch up. They're like, oh my God. And I'll like decline the call. I'm like, no, I just wanted to do I just wanted to like say yes and put some hearts. I don't need to talk right I now. I don't want to talk. That's happened to me before, but it's on the other end. We're all right. So maybe someone will respond. I'll be like, oh, they're yeah. available. But it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. I haven't replied to your email for a reason. It's bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm really lucky because like I, I get to live by myself and I have a couple of sweethearts that like get to come every two weeks or whatever. So that's kind of like how I'm keeping it together. <laughs> yeah. Ann Bruce posts these 30 seconds at the beach. So she lives in Channel Islands Beach and her front yard is literally the beach. So she does these quick little videos every day and you get to see the beach and She's gorgeous and talks about these amazing, she, now she's like the spirit junkie, which I think is fantastic mm -hmm. because I remember when I met Anne, as she came to Austin and she was helping me with my TED talk and my book. And I was just going, and then I need to do this. And then I need to do this. And then I've got to do this. And why isn't this working? And why is she this? And, blah, blah, blah. and she was like, Anne, you need to learn how to breathe. And she's yeah. really the one who started me on this whole thing going, you know, I don't breathe correctly. Like I'm taking shallow breaths. Yes. And we had this guy on, his name is Mo Brissett. And I hadn't met Mo before we did the Facebook Live. And first of all, he's a hottie. So he was showing mm -hmm. us how to breathe. And I thought he should take off his shirt and demonstrate. But mm -hmm. He didn't, um, oh, but he talked about this technique called diaphragmatic breathing where when you inhale, you put your belly out like a Buddha belly. And mm. then when you exhale, you bring it back in and it forces you to get a full deep breath of air. And so three of those statistically Ooh. is supposed to take you out of that sympathetic fight or flight and put you mm. back into that parasympathetic rest and digest. Yeah. So I've been finding myself like it, when I see my shoulders are creeping up like earrings, I've been taking some really deep breaths and it it's crazy how well it works it works yeah. you just have to practice you yeah. know like you just have to like really make it a regular thing so that you do it without thinking yeah any you can make anything subconscious like think about it we didn't used to reach for our phones you can you can always introduce a new behavior have you ever left the house without your phone and like felt panicked no not anymore i literally have two myths on my plate <laughs> If I do, I mean, I yeah, like I've, I'm kind of, I've become like this little hermit crab. No, but I mean, like if I leave my phone at home accidentally, all my numbers, all my emails, all my contacts, mm -hmm. all my, like, I can't get a hold of it. I don't even know my kids' phone numbers. They're like, how do you not know my number? I'm like, because it's in my phone. 
they'll be fine without you. <laughs> it's just 30 minutes. Nothing is nothing worse could happen. Like I literally am giving per people permission to just live in a state of semi -de denial and delusion. It could be whatever you want. Who knows? Yeah. This could all be amazing. I mean, it is definitely real. Please stay home and wash your hands. But yeah, like you don't know. It could be whatever you want. Life is supposed to be whatever you want. You know, we just got to ride this out. All you have to do is stay alive and be kind to yourself, you know? I, you know, I've, I've been working a lot with a bunch of um, senior level executives. And one of the things they, uh, a couple of them have mentioned is, you know, everyone's like, when can we go back to normal? And they were saying they used to bitch and complain about the way things were. They didn't like the processes. They didn't like the way mm -hmm. things were working. And now all of a sudden it's like, we want to go back to those. And it's kind of like those, you know, this, that saying it's, it's sometimes it's easier to be um, uncomfortable with old problems than uncomfortable with new solutions mm. because at least they're the problems you know right and yes. so you're used to griping about it and you're you're yes. used to being frustrated by it when there could be a better way to do something like i deal yes. i speak to a lot of teachers and you know as as much as this has been overwhelming for them there's been more technological advance in education mm -hmm. in the last three months than there has in the last 30 years mm -hmm. i mean it's just really when you don't have a choice, mm -hmm. that's when growth happens. Necessity is the mother of invention, you know, and, yep. and that's the thing. We weren't going the right way anyway, you know, like these systems were terrible. In fact, one of the people who opposed us about corporate counseling was like, well, you know, obviously it's good for, for employees and everything, but they were like, when we get back, it's going to be like the prisoners are running the prison. You know, you've had people who've been working at home, fucking off in meetings, not wearing pants. Like you can't tell them shit when they come back, you know, they are going to need some help for the managers. And who knows if we need, need middle managers anymore. I'm like maybe employees have more, have earned more autonomy and respect. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do think it, it's definitely time, especially when it comes to healthcare, like as you mentioned with innovation and education, I have been like literally, me tell so many people have been about this issue with therapy. The whole issue is that technically you're not supposed to practice across state lines because that's what nurses are upheld to and doctors are upheld to. But like, why? It's the United States of America. 77% of American counties don't have enough therapists. Even in Idaho, where your son is, it's crazy. Um, we were actually contacted by the College of Eastern Idaho they were having a huge regional resurgence and the College of Eastern Idaho and Ida Fall, Idaho Falls had like tripled like their attendance and stuff. And so they looked into it. They're the second fastest growing state in the union, but they're eighth in American suicides. And so, yeah, it's just really rural. It's just potatoes. There's more potatoes than people, you know? And, you know, it's like just a really old new town. So they looked into it and there weren't even enough therapists in the entire state of Idaho to serve, let alone enough for this small, yeah, it's really spread out. In New York, it's hard to get a good therapist or somebody who's taking your clients. Some states, it's hard to get a therapist at all. Or there is one and you don't want your car seen outside her office, you know? So that's why recently the administration actually lifted this um, limitation that you can now practice across state line. That has been needing to happen for the last however many years, not just because of the convenience factor for, for people in rural communities, just the people who are differently abled. Like yeah. why would we limit this good service without getting the proper protocols in place? So I'm glad, all for new planning in the new world. I hope that women can, are gonna be in charge. I'm a female chauvinist, like all sorts of stuff, girl. We can have whatever we want on the other side. I'm telling Tell you. Tell everybody what you said on the panel. You said your parents talked you to act like oh, you yes. were I am so patriotic. I believe in the American dream. Neither one of my grandmothers could read or write. My family's from Ghana. And in one generation, I live, get to live my life as a white man. Like, honestly, I, like, I'm entitled. I'm horny. I'm always offending people. I get, you know, I get to live my dreams, like, with investor money. Like, I live, I live in New York. I got a 24-year-old thing on the side. Like, I get to live, like, pretty, like, a white man in America, which shouldn't have been possible. So I hope when America <laughs> gets back to its senses, you know, like, you know, we remember the things that made it like so iconic and exceptional yeah 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 i know and it it's so i love that you're making it so accessible because to your point like i live in austin most of the i, I would say 95 percent of the psychiatrists i've contacted for evan are not taking new patients mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even a sure. higher even a higher number do not take insurance and the first mm -hmm. appointment is you know anywhere between 400 and 600 dollars um, just for the initial consult. That's not okay. Right. And so it's like how it, it's one of those things where it, it's unfortunate that you price people out of exactly mental health. 
And I love that you're investing. Yes. Like even if we have to make it a co-op, even if we have to make it a nonprofit of some sort, I, we will have mental health care that is not tied to your insurance or to your, your employer, because that's the thing, like even with all these corporate sales, yes, it's nice. Yes. It helps us fund and subsidize the the Mm -hmm. lower price point for the consumers. But even if I sell to Uber, I could sell the entire Uber C-suite, Uber drivers, people have to drive Uber on the side will never get access to that perk. So I'm just trying to make it affordable and accessible. It's priced as a nice to have, but now we know that it's a must have, Mm -hmm. like it should be like anything else. And so, yeah, like to me, I like to think of it as a customer service line for your life. I just want it to be a normal thing that everybody can just reach in their phone like whenever they need like just you know before the st- they start to spiral I, I want it to be seen as a preventative thing rather than like last ditch effort yeah I think we wait until desperation yeah. takes over instead of focusing on inspiration you know we, yeah. we wait like, I want to be better not like how I have to save this somehow <laughs> now that it's right. too late yeah, and it, it's almost like it has to hurt bad enough where you are to force you to be uncomfortable where you want to go or where you want to go has to be so compelling that you're willing to be uncomfortable in order to get there. Otherwise, we just stay stuck with old problems and we keep griping and bitching and repeating the cycle we have it. and, you know, and make excuses. Oh, I've been busy or, oh, I can't do that. But it's like, I, I feel like mental health is, has to be a priority and- yeah kids need it like that's that was the eye-opening thing for me even with nami um you know i donate a portion of all my book proceeds there and i'm really involved and i i love them and especially the central texas chapter is amazing karen mm-hmm. reynas runs it and she's fabulous oh, but, like NAMI. thank you for all you're doing well i thank them right they saved they literally saved our life i started nami when evan was four years old Oh. And I didn't even know he was, he, he didn't have a diagnosis yet. He was already on an antipsychotic um, from his neurologist, but um, Bra is a fantastic real word. <laughs> I think he meant B, but. It bra- auto corrects to Bra all the time. All the time. <laughs> even in my own phone. I am flattered. Thank you, Ann. Yeah. I'm worried. Yeah. Everybody's given up on bras since the virus, but I still. <laughs> my husband was like. Bra. What are you going to do as soon as you finish Facebook? And I'm like, take off my bra. Like, <laughs> and then whip it around. <laughs> yeah, it's like the 70s up in here. <laughs> oh, man, I hope we get to the 70s after this. They had like a really bad crisis and then they had the hippie flower child in a bit. So I'm ready for yeah. that. So Martha, awesome. Martha asked a great question. What are the resources, books, podcasts? What do you recommend for people who really want to take some time to, to build up their mental health? Oh man, so many. So um, I would definitely always say another Texas girl because you're in Texas. People don't know I'm from Houston, just like Beyonce and Lizzo and Meg Thee Stallion and NASA. Lots of great ladies from Texas, Miss Laura and um, Brene Brown, of course, the queen of right course. now. Of the queen right now, Brene Brown definitely read the Daring Way. I think she has a new book. Just start with her Netflix schedule. Uh, her Netflix special. She's one of the yep. first to introduce the concept of shame, which is, as we say, the guilt, the feeling bad about feeling bad. Like, let's just start there, and then we can address what the root cause. Um, I think for anybody who has ever had trauma in their life, um, and actually, you know what? We are people talk about PTSD. We're an active trauma <laughs> disorder right now. Like anybody, because this, this is a disruptive event to our lives, so this is potentially traumatic. Um, there's right. a really great book called "The Body Keeps the Score." And it's about how trauma informs our patterns, how we think about things, how we treat people. And also I'll say for people with kids, you know, as much as, you know, I love kids, I'm very committed to this bachelor life, you know, but, you know, I really, you know, what the reason I'm in mental health is because I had such an intense experience emotionally when I was an adolescent. And so I really am sensitive to the teenage experience. And they're really struggling right now. You know, they've got all those hormones. Adolescent suicide rates were already going up. This is something that's completely out of their control. You know, like I really stick with them. And so rather than worrying too much about school, if you have kids at home, I definitely recommend just kind of letting them ride this out and like really letting them feel the wave of their emotions because what they're gonna remember from this time is one, their attachment patterns. That's what they're really learning, right? When we talk about the book Attached, that's also a great one. It talks about uh, avoid it and anxious. Um, Their attachment patterns, their communication, effective communication strategy, because there's a whole lot of negotiating on family time and boundaries and stuff like that. Um, their, Their trust patterns, like, do they trust what's going on out there in their house? Like, there's so many conflicting messages and their coping mechanisms. 
are they the fight type kind? Are they the flight kind? Are they the freeze kind? There's also a fog that people forget about, which a lot of us were in in the first couple months. So like, honestly, teenagers can be shitty and smelly <laughs> and anxious, but for real, like this is their time. Like get, be as gentle with them as possible. They're new babies now, this is a new world. So as much as you can help them through with emotional support, please try. Are there any good resources for people with teens? I've got one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So one is my favorite, Dr. Sari Locker. She's my mentor at Columbia University. She's a key foremost expert on adolescent mental health. Tell me her name again. Dr. Sari Locker. It's S-A-R-I, Sari like Mary Locker. She's like she's also an expert on, on um, teenage sexuality. So she's really good for all you horn dogs at home who are just trying to understand what's going on. Um, and then, oh, my poor ponytail. And then, um, geez, I'm looking at all the books, but I can't read them. I will send afterwards a list. You should right, have made put it in the right. Facebook comments. But yeah, yeah, yeah. What I was I, telling, oh, yeah, that's a good one. I was telling B today, you know, my daughter is 18 and she is, um, you know, was supposed to graduate from high school next week. And Austin, they had this announcement on TV that Krispy Kreme was giving a free dozen donuts to any graduating senior. Well, Riley went to Krispy Kreme today after she finished work and school and, she, you know, she's still doing all those things. And she she goes to Krispy Kreme and she pulls up at the window and they're, they're like, that'll be twelve dollars and eighty seven cents. And she said, I thought they were free for seniors. And they're like, that was only Tuesday. And she just burst into tears and she's like, why am I so upset over donuts? And I'm like, because it's not the donuts, right? Like you're going through so many intense hormones yes. and emotions and, and they don't have the language or the durability yet to deal with it like yeah. their feelings at the very least it, it's yeah and it's hard because when it comes across as moody or irritable or distant it's so easy to just be like what is your problem you know right. it's i find myself doing that a lot even though i study this i'm like could you mm -hmm. do you really have to act like that that's not polite that's not nice and it's like mm -hmm. all right well it, we're struggling going through Ms. Rona, which I love that you call her that. Ms. We're Rona. struggling with Ms. Rona. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine being 16, 17, 18, even young kids. What do you say for young kids? Like, do you tell them what's going on? Do you tell them the truth? Um, yeah, I mean, as much as they can understand, I always encourage talking to kids like adults. They're going to be future people, you know, let protect their innocence, obviously, let them figure out as much as they can. But childhood is so short compared to how long adult and miserable adulthood is. Try and just let them be kids. It's not their fault. They don't know things. Let them just be as dumb as they want to be. If they want to have hope and climb every mountain. <laughs> like, it sounds like a lot of men I know. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> honestly. Honestly. One um, thing I'm gonna do, oh my God, I love men so much, but I do I do hope that a lot of men use the difference because they got issues. <laughs> well, I'm curious, do you know any statistics about divorce or you know that happening right now? Because I, you know, I love my husband more than life itself. He is my best friend, he is my champion, he is amazing. And yesterday I was like, stop blinking so loudly. Oh my god. <laughs> Like, I'm ready to scream. And he was oh like, Oh my God. <laughs> Y'all, just so you know, Anne's husband built that beautiful llama he office did. for her. He did. Like that llama her. He, that's how good of a man he is. And she still got tired of his ass. It's not, you know, just don't take it personal. <laughs> yeah. It, it's one of those things where, like, I think everybody just has to give themselves some grace yeah, and, grace. and, and each other as well. What can I do to help you? What do you, do you is there anything we can do to support you? Well, yeah, I mean, and that's an excellent point to end on because the only way we get through this is together, y'all. So take care of each other, take care of yourselves. Um, and yeah, we're going to be launching The Difference soon. We had to pause. We are supposed to launch on the 15th. But everything's unpredictable, but I'm so glad to finally give birth to this idea. We've been in stealth just doing corporate clients, but now anybody will be able to use it. Only for the first month, people who are on the wait list. So make sure you go to thedifference.co. That's thedifference.co. And um, sign up for our wait list. You can also follow us on Instagram at the difference.co and uh, the dot difference.co and yeah just get on the wait list and yeah support therapists support each other take care of yourself oh so my friend Kat said we need you every Friday which I think is I would love I it I would love that text us out time. again Yes. Will you be my guest again at some point? Of course. Of course I will. I love you so much. And will you be my guest on Be The Change? I guess I should get back up on it for season two. Check out Be The Change on Simplecast, sponsored by Sonos.
Yes, ma'am. And I, I can't wait to um, speak for the crisis text line and meet Nancy at oh. some point um, when we're allowed to travel again, because it just blows me away what they're doing and how many people you're helping. And I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to chill with me and have a cocktail with me. Um, oh. I, I think you're fantastic. Everybody, thank you so much for joining. V, have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy Memorial Day and your and and your tequila. I'll have one with you. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Bye, thank everyone. Everybody. Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day.